get going. Uh, we are so fortunate to have John and uh, from Silicon Valley Bank. Um, we had John came to uh, as our guest on our podcast, and I thought it would be great for you to have the opportunity to ask him directly uh, this, uh, from this session. John will talk about the investment, the exit trends uh, in uh, med tech and in health tech. He's going to go into like who's investing, what the exit, all this kind of good stuff that we'd like to know. Uh, a little bit of, you know, I felt like I don't need to introduce John because I feel like everybody knows John from being in the industry. John is the managing director of Silicon Valley Bank. He's done a lot of his report is everybody's always waiting for every year. Um, he has 20 plus year experience and banking experience working in a healthcare company and venture firms. And so, so that's John. And today we also have Ben Johnson. He is uh, our partner also at uh, Silicon Valley Bank. And he is the lead for the life science at early stage company at Silicon Valley Bank. And he is going to help um, answer many of the questions that you have and uh, moderate the question that you have for John today. John is kind to uh, take question along the way. So if you have any question, uh, please put it in the Q&A box and then we'll answer it along the way. And with that, John, take it away. Thanks so much, Christine. Great to chat with you again. And, you know, uh, Ben and I have ham and egged it on these types of presentations uh, a lot of times over the years. So happy to do it again. And, you know, let me share my screen and let's get the presentation on there. And so, yeah, you know, we put together this uh, overview on what we see in the market twice a year, but we're constantly looking at the data and understanding what what trends are emerging. And so, the idea for the for the discussion today is to to really focus on device and health tech, but with the context of taking a look at what we're seeing overall in healthcare investments, the venture dollars that are being raised to be put to work, and then the activity that we're seeing. Then we're gonna focus specifically on device and health tech on the investment side. We'll talk a little bit about SPAC activity, and then we'll look at M&A and IPO exit activity, then maybe a little bit of, you know, where do we think things are gonna go from here? But, you know, 2021 certainly has been an amazing year already. Um, and you'll see that in some of the, the first slides that we're seeing today. So with that, we'll just jump in with the idea that if you do have a question, I'll be sort of pausing after I talk about device and looking for questions, pausing after health tech, then we'll get into the exit side as well. So there'll be times to sort of jump in with specific questions and I welcome it. We'd love to talk about that as we're going through the presentation. Um, so with that, let's sort of talk about the investment side first. This first slide looks at VC investment. So we look at every single venture fund that's closed on a yearly basis and say, you know, how much of of that fund, if any, is being invested into healthcare. And if the answer is 100%, then we count 100% of that fund. But if it's a fund like NEA, for example, that does both tech and healthcare, we estimate how much dollars are gonna be allocated to healthcare. And so that kind of equals the numbers that you see on this chart here, which are the dollars that we think are fundraised in that particular year that is going to be invested into healthcare. And that's typically an investment cycle of one to three years where you're investing into new companies. And then these venture firms are supporting those companies through subsequent rounds over the next seven to 10 years. And so you can see there's a couple jumps in overall venture funding for healthcare. You know, fundraising from 13 to 14, you saw a big jump up. Another jump from 16 to 17, where you saw nine to $10 billion a year in 2017 through 2019. A huge jump up in 2020 at $16.8 billion. That was fundraised, again, just in the U.S., not including um, hedge funds, not including OUS, not including uh, corporate venture, but just venture dollars to be allocated to healthcare. And then in the first half of 2021, really things just exploded, where you saw you know, a jump up to $21.8 billion just in the first half of this year. And it's really being led by the type of exits that we're seeing out in the market, the quick um, you know, uh, uptakes in valuation between series A and B and C across all sectors led to an influx in what uh, venture folks call TVPI, which is sort of the implied valuation of their, of their portfolio. 
And then we also saw a lot of M&A and IPO, which led to distributions back to the LPs. So these funds have had really interesting gains and distributions in a pretty quick time frame, which has allowed them to come to the market even faster. And so this $21.8 billion really is a function of you know, great returns and fast fundraising and investment. And so when you look at uh, the fundraising cycle times in healthcare, it used to be three to four years between raising uh, for these venture funds. Now it's more two to two and a half years, sometimes even, even faster. And then you're seeing these funds, not only are they raising their traditional venture funds to invest in healthcare, but they're also raising what we call opportunity funds, which is a way for them to double down in the, in the investments that they really like that they're already investor in so that they can you know, leverage their ability to invest in the late rounds. And so all that equals lots of capital in the, in the market. And I think what I did on the bottom slide uh, part of the slide is sort of highlight a couple of the ones that are a little bit more focused on med, med tech, just so you can see the amount of folks that, are, that have raised just in the first half of 2021 would have you know, allocations to healthcare. Uh, and so with that as a backdrop of a lot of venture capital dollars in the market ready to be invested, let's look at the dollars that are actually being invested into companies. And so this slide is looking at uh, dollars invested into the companies in both US and Europe uh, by sectors. And so you see the color coding on the bottom, and there's really four sectors that we cover uh, at the bank, biopharma, health tech, DX, tools, and device. And there's a couple of things I wanted to take away from this slide to sort of, you know, pave the, pave the way to a more of a detailed discussion for device and health tech. One is if you look back in 2020, and you can see, you know, 18 and 19 were very good years for investment into, into healthcare uh, venture-backed companies. But in 2020, in the first quarter, we saw a real surge in investment. And then Q2, that was really the start of the pandemic. That was when everything really shut down. A lot of companies shut down. Obviously, face-to-face -face interactions were, came to a standstill. And everyone was sort of doing everything virtually and trying to figure out what was happening from here. But what was interesting to me is in Q2, we actually saw investments into, you know, new investments into healthcare companies actually increase. And so I think it's really a testament to the networking and the close knit sort of connections that we have within the life science industry to continue to see that type of activity, even in a sense where you're not getting face to face interaction, because a lot of this stuff, uh, these financings were done over Zoom. And then Q3, and you, know, you saw another uptick and Q4 was strong. And so that set the stage for 2021. And in 2021, you know, not, to, not to sort of say similar to what I said on the venture capital side, but you know, investment exploded again. And, and when you saw in the first quarter of 2021, you saw uh, $23 billion invested into uh, venture-backed healthcare companies to set a record by a significant margin over what we saw as the record in Q3 of 2020. And what's also interesting, it's not just a few deals that were you know, $600 million financings, because when you look at the actual number of deals, you, know, you saw a significant increase as well, the 617 deals. And then in Q2, where you would think maybe, okay, Q1 was, was a crazy quarter, what's gonna happen in Q2? Q2 went up even more and to set another record for investment. So we were at $47 billion invested into venture-backed healthcare companies in the US and Europe in just the first half of the year, whereas the full year 2020, which was a record year, was at 50 billion. So you know, basically, you know, you're seeing the, the opportunity for investments to almost double in, in 2021 off of a huge record year of 2020. And so, when you look at it by sector, um, I think there's a couple of things. One, health tech, they've already in the first half of this year raised $14.6 billion, which is bigger than they raised in the full year 2020. And you can see on the device sector, which I've uh, highlighted as well, device in the first half of the year is also really strong. Um, and so all these sectors are, are set for record years and health tech's already hit a record. So with that, let's go into detail on the device side. Um, and, and looking at Series A in medical device. And I think the one you know, really great um, 
you know, uh, byline for medical device is that Series A is up significantly. And you can see the first half number at 516 million, way higher, uh, you know, on pace to, to, to be way higher than we saw in 2020, which was, you know, a two year reduction from what we saw in 2018. So there were two years of successfully less dollars being invested into device series A. Now we're seeing it pick up. And if I think about the areas where we're seeing it mostly focused and within series A device, I would say non-invasive monitoring, which I define as sort of sensor-based technology that's capturing data um, is one big area. And within that, we saw really a lot of focus on cardiovascular monitoring. And then we also saw a lot of early stage neurology. And so NeuroSTEM continues to be a very big area where there's a lot of investment, uh, including late stage, but Series A as well. And then also, you know, um, we're seeing some really interesting investments in brain computer interface technology, which, you know, to me sounds, you know, uh, yeah, uh, so far in the future that it's hard to contemplate, but you're seeing a lot of that. And obviously you have Elon Musk who had his Neuralink company who actually raised a big round, I think this year as well, a lot of dollars into that. But those two sectors, we saw a lot of activity. And just to give you a sense of how we define Series A for us, this is any deal where it's a $2 million equity investment or larger uh, equals a Series A for us. Um, and so yeah, with that, let's look overall within device for the first half of the year. Again, we are on pace to have a, a, a nice record year. Uh, we're at 4.6 billion invested into in the first half across all rounds. And overall, when you look at it, there's a there's three areas that I think are, are most interesting. You know, one is uh, is is on the overall surgical side in robotic surgery. So you're seeing robotic surgical companies really get a lot of later stage as well as early stage financing, both in the surgical robotic companies themselves, as well as the imaging AI machine learning technology around those companies. Um, and then on the neuro side, again, we see a lot of activity and we see a lot of these late stage deals. And what's interesting to me is that we're seeing folks come downstream, a lot of private equity and hedge fund folks coming in to lead these late stage rounds. And then also on the imaging side, we saw a lot of a lot of activity. And so we're seeing big deals, but we're also seeing a lot of new leads in these Series B uh, financings, which to me, that was, you know, besides having Series A being down, the, the lack of the ability of finding new venture investors for Series B deals that typically are in the middle or just starting clinical trials. Uh, was a big issue in the market. So we are seeing a lot more of those uh, actually happening, which is great to see. Um, the other thing uh, before we go to the next slide is when I look at the highest valued private companies, and this is looking at pitch book data for private financings and device and looking at which ones had the highest post money valuations after their financings in the first half of 2021. You can see the, the companies listed over here with you know, Procept already you know, uh, about, uh, on, on the public track, right? Or have gone public. Um, you can see all these areas that you're seeing high valuations. Where in biopharma, it tends to be very focused on platform and oncology. Here on the device side, it kind of goes across, across the board. So you're seeing a lot of different indications having some really high valuations. And that's really being led by the strong IPO market that we've seen out there. And then finally, on the device side, if you look at who the most active investors are in new deals, um, I want to stress on the late stage crossover side, we're seeing a lot of these late stage folks, a lot of them were doing crossover rounds on the biopharma side exclusively, and have now seen how uh, lucrative the device IPO market is, as well as some increases on the M&A side, which I'll talk about in the second half of our talk. And you're seeing a lot of those folks coming into device deals. So folks like Perceptive Advisors and RA Capital and Red Mile and Deerfield and Cormorant, uh, even D1, these have been folks that have been active in a lot of the other areas. Uh, some of those have been active in device for a long time, but most, a lot of these folks are new entrants into the device sector. But it's that, that capital that's out there, which is leading the increase in Series A and the excitement about the sector. And the only reason they're in here is because they're excited about M&A and or IPO opportunities down the road. And so that's kind of the overview of investment side for uh, a device. So maybe I'll take a quick pause here 
And Ben, if you see any questions or if anyone wants to you know, jump in with, with questions, uh, uh, we could do that before we jump into health tech. Yeah, thanks, John. I, I don't have any open questions right now. I had a question or two, though. Uh, maybe they can be briefly answered. Um, one sure. of them um, has to do with 510K versus Zenovo versus PMA. Were you planning on talking about that? Or you see what are you seeing yes. as far as trends in, uh, uh, based on your clinical pathway? So um, we don't we don't look at those on the investment side, but we certainly do look at them on the exit side. And actually, I have a slide that I snuck in there uh, on the exit slide that's actually going to look at the type of activity we've seen on exits for 510K versus PMA versus 510K de novo, which I think we'll, we'll and maybe we'll talk a little bit about how, what that means for the investment side when we get to that one. But that's that's a great question. So we do have some stuff on that coming coming up. And then the other quick question is, how do you handle the fact that so many companies these days are combining a med tech with a DX or a med tech with a you know cloud-based component? And a lot of companies are, are starting to play in more than one healthcare and life science vertical. And you know, how does that affect our ability to tell the story and uh, talk about the numbers and stuff? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And, and actually, um, for health tech, we have a lot of folks that sort of cross over. And you'll see that uh, on the next slide when we talk about health tech. You'll see little asterisks next to companies that are also either device or DX tools types of companies. But when I think about device, I think, is there an actual piece of equipment that goes along with it, especially on the imaging side? If the imaging side is just SaaS based, um, then that sort of that will go into you know, DX tools, DX analytics, or maybe health tech. But if it's actually has an imaging technology, that's a piece of equipment that is combined with, with uh, AI machine learning software based, uh, then that still stays in device. So it's a little bit complicated. And I think the same thing is in non-invasive monitoring. If there's a sensor that's actually a part of uh, your, you're getting attached to your body, that's, that's driving the data, even though that data is going into the cloud and you could say, oh, this is a lot of health tech type of activity. The fact that there's a piece of equipment or a sensor that's that part of it, I kind of put it into device. So it's complicated is a, is a short answer, but we do our best to try and define those. And when you look at our glossary of our overall paper, you can get a sense of how we're defining these things. But again, really good question, Ben. Um, we have some, we have three open questions now. I don't know, do you, do you want to try to answer one more? Yeah, let's go for it. Um, one of them was just on defining health tech, which I suspect you could probably do in the next slide or two. Yes. Um, so we'll get to that one live in a moment. Uh, another one has to do with uh, what is the average size of later stage crossover investments? And, uh, you know, uh, what's the minimum level that's impactful for that type of investor? So I think if you're talking about device, um, I, would, I would sort of go back to, you know, we're seeing a lot of deals that are, let's say, 30 to a hundred million dollars. And I think that range would be the ones where you would find these folks really active on the late stage side. Now, Cormorant has done some really early stage deals with Shifamed, but I would throw that as, a, as an aside. But for most of these folks, I think you're, you're thinking about 30 million plus on the round size and probably 40 to a hundred um, to really get them uh, excited based on who you already have involved in the earlier stage on the venture side wanting to get their piece as well. So I would say that's kind of the size uh, for, for later stage. And so maybe with that, I'll, I'll jump into, into health tech. And really when we think about health tech, um, you think about things that are touching the healthcare system, but we're not talking about consumer-based apps. We are talking about things that integrate into the healthcare system or things that are, are used by hospitals or alternative care um, outside the hospital. So that's kind of how we are defining health tech. And here what you'll see you know, is continued investment in, in health tech up and to the right. We're already about equal to what we invested in 2020 at a billion five. We're already close to that in the first half of 2021. And really that's been led by provider operations and, and those are either companies that are selling into existing healthcare ecosystems. And again, this is just ways of making, you know, the, the operations that the hospitals are doing in, uh, you know, more seamless, or it's, it's, it's actually working with alternative care companies in a new way of, of operationally uh, 
uh, um, impacting their service or enacting their service. So provider operations actually was the biggest area for Series A investment that we saw in the first in the first half of the year. And uh, and I think you know two of the top four Series A pre monies were provider operations, where you look at you know Relife, which raised twelve million on a seventy eight million dollar pre and Zenter. 78. So you're seeing in terms of the valuations in health tech, I will say if you're comparing valuations in health tech versus device, uh, health tech kind of has a multiple in terms of bigger valuation than what we're seeing in device right now. Um, and if I look at overall, um, here's where you see, and this includes the ones where we have these asterisks that in, so if like a, a company like Element Biosciences, which I think is also on the DX tool side, um, for the first slide that, or the first second slide that we showed, where we looked at the different sectors and where the dollars are going in, I only counted that company once because you don't want to double count a company when you're looking at it sector, uh, you know, sectors all together to look at the overall investment in the industry. But I added in to health tech because it also can be a health tech company. That's where you see this almost twenty billion dollar number uh, in the first half of 2021, which is far and away bigger than we saw for the full year of 2020. And in this area, alternative care at 8.4 billion is really you know, where we see the vast amount of capital going. And when we think about alternative care, we really think about care outside of a hospital. And within alternative care, we saw mental health and chronic care management as two of the biggest areas where we've saw investment. And on top of that, you know, digital health benefits also was a huge area. So those three really were uh, the most impactful within the alternative care space. And so, you know, that is, is really a, sort of what makes up this big $8.4 billion number. Although that being said, the sheer number of these companies and the fact that there's a lot of them that are competing in the same space, it really kind of uh, pushes a uh, possibility for um, consolidation and M&A in this area. And so we expect there to be a decent amount of shakeup there. Um, you know, the one thing I wanted to mention when we talked, to, I, I mentioned valuations before, uh, but in 2021, just the first half, there were 28 companies that did a private venture back financing in a healthcare company that had a post money valuation of a billion dollars or more. And I think last year there were maybe 15 of those deals for the whole year. This year, 28, just in the first half. So you are seeing some really, really, really big financings uh, in health tech at really big valuations. And what's interesting is you're seeing some of these really big players uh, leading the call, like Tiger Global did seven of those billion dollar deals in the first half. And then you saw SoftBank and Bailey Gifford, uh, which is uh, you know, uh, more of a yeah, asset manager type player uh, do to each. And so lots of high valuations there. The question is, how does that get transitioned into, into value, uh, either in M&A or SPAC or IPO, which we'll talk about in, in a moment. But let's, uh, and then on the far right, when we took about the highest valued companies, you can see there's a lot of companies that are private that have billion dollar plus valuations. You can see alternative care and provider operations really dominate the highest valued companies. And on the investor side, you can see it's kind of all over the map. You're seeing a lot of tech investors that are investing into venture, venture capital, health tech companies. You're seeing other folks that have been around uh, for a long time that have a specialty within healthcare. So it's a really, it's a big combination. And on the corporate side, you're seeing you know, folks like GV that are very active, but also you know, a lot of payer provider folks, as well as some big pharma that are jumping in to be big investors in this scenario as well. And that's really, and what's interesting there is you're seeing a lot of that as sort of a, a collaboration besides investment, where there's opportunities to leverage the technology that they're investing in directly into their patients, into pilot testing, which again is a really interesting area. And then on a late stage crossover side, you continue to see some of these big players. These are the folks that are that are really doing a lot of the deals where you're seeing the billion dollar post money. And maybe with that, before we get into the exit side, I'll pause to see if there's any specific questions on the on the healthcare investment side. Ben, did anything show up at this point? Yeah, there's one question just uh, asking to clarify alternative care. 
a little yeah. bit more. You can spend a little bit more time just defining what that actually means. Yeah, and and you know, I would say very you know open kimono. Um, I am I am really an expert in all these sectors. I would say health tech is my is where I have less expertise, but I'll try. This is my best because I I leverage my my colleagues to help specifically on the health tech side. Alternative care to me is care outside of the hospital, and it can be brick and mortar. It can be telemedicine. It can be, you know, software-based, you know, opportunities, but it's ways for the patient to engage with the healthcare system outside the hospital. And so we look at it as virtual care where, you know, you're, you are, you're not uh, engaging at all in, in anywhere other than, you know, through your phone or computer, et cetera. And then you have sort of hybrid care, which we have a combination of folks who are setting up their own brick and mortar outside the hospital, but are also including virtual. And so we saw those are the really the biggest areas of, a, of investment that I've seen on, on in the alternative care arena. Ben, do you have anything to add on that one? Just the only thing I would add is that, um, so I, I lead the seed stage life science business for SVB for the US and uh, alternative care is a hugely growing segment of our seed stage client population. So there are a lot of companies out there and, and within alternative care, I would say mental health is the one that has the, the, the most amount of traction right now as far as um, company formation, et cetera. So we try to keep track real closely of like, you know, especially at the seed stage, what types of companies are these and try to aggregate, and try to uh, make sense of it. Uh, because we think that um, if we can have an understanding of what's on the bleeding edge, it's going to show up in who our earliest stage companies are, we think. So, but yeah, alternative care and yep. specifically mental health are at the top of that list. Yeah. And, and obviously, you know, COVID and the pandemic had a big uh, effect on what we've seen over the last couple of years because people just did not want to or feel comfortable going into the hospital. So this was really a pivot. And I think, you know, there's been a lot of push for alternative care for a long period of time, you know, within, you know, the healthcare system, but it hasn't really been, uh, you know, uh, impacted or enacted upon. And I think finally, you know, the leverage of where we were with the pandemic really has forced this to, to maybe go faster than, than uh, um, we've seen in the past. And so it's really forced it to become front and center. And that has really spurred the type of investment increase that we've seen over the last couple of years. Because once you started to see that it works, um, you know, these companies scaled very quickly. And that's where you're seeing a lot of these $100 million plus rounds. And so with that, maybe we'll, we'll jump into, you know, quickly just talking about the SPACs and, and SPACs, you know, special purpose acquisition vehicles. These are ones where, you know, uh, we're specifically focused on either the hedge funds that are very healthcare focused or traditional venture funds that are going out and raising these, you know, these SPACs to acquire, uh, private companies. And basically it's a way for them to get public without doing an IPO. And, you know, there are deals that are consummated. Once the deal goes through, we call it a de-SPAC. So basically you're de into this public company uh, from being a private company and the SPAC goes away and you have this company that was private, but it's now public. And so, you know, overall in this sector, we've seen 36 announced de transactions for venture-backed healthcare companies. There were 16 that were biopharma, 10 in health tech, seven DX tools, three in device. Only 12 of those really had completed by the end of the first half of this year. But what's interesting to see is, you know, the SPAC performance, um, you know, post de spacking has been uh, largely negative. And, and when you compare it to what type of average IPO performance you see in the different sectors, it's a huge difference. So especially in device where, Device IPOs have been really, really spectacular, but the average SPAC performance at a negative 42%, uh, health tech minus 19%, biopharma minus 30%. And so what's interesting is you're seeing the average step up in terms of the valuation for these SPACs to be pretty good. But I think you know, once these companies go public, there's not a lot of room to grow there. And so we've seen actually those companies drop in terms of their share price. And so I think... Yeah, there's still a lot more information to be gathered as we see whether these SPACs really are the great way for these companies to bypass an IPO, because um, there's not enough data really to make a determination on there. But we will get to see a lot more data as we get through the rest of this year 
and have a little bit better spe specifics on, on, on our take on here. But what I do say is there's a lot of SPACs out there that um, are looking for targets. The way that they uh, make their case versus an IPO or another alternative financing is a lot of times through valuation. So the valuation has been good and the step up's been good. And the question is, can these deals get to be consummated? Because they have been taking a little bit of, of a time to get through all the, the machinations to actually de -SPAC. And we've seen a couple of deals, especially on the health tech side, announce an agreement to uh, potentially merge with a SPAC uh, and then having those fall through. And those companies deciding, you know what, maybe it's better to do another private financing still at a good valuation and keep my IPO optionality instead of going through with the SPAC. So we've seen a couple uh, anecdotal uh, situations like that. So we're really kind of keeping an eye on where things are going. There's no doubt that there are a lot of SPACs around looking for um, opportunities to put money to work. And so maybe maybe with that, unless there's a specific question on, on SPAC that came up, uh, uh, Ben, we'll go into sort of the exit, the exit side. Uh, no, not that I can see. Okay, and, and again, happy to, happy to talk about SPACs when we get to the Q&A after. So let's just make sure we're, we're covering everything in enough, in enough time to have time for, for uh, questions and answers at the end. So on, on the M&A and IPO side, let's first look at the device side. So just to give you a sense of what I define as a private M&A and an IPO, a private M&A is a venture-backed company that gets acquired before they go public for at least $50 million up front, five zero. Those are the deals that are in my data set. Or these are venture-backed companies that end up IPOing and raise at least $25 million in proceeds. So you do see a lot of really small IPOs where maybe they're raising 10 or $15 million. I'm not counting those companies. Or the companies that are acquired, you know, maybe for $100 million, but only $5 million is up front. Again, not, those are not companies that I'm, a, I'm looking at in my data set. It's a very defined company. From the perspective of these are the bigger companies and these are the ones that actually have you know, real returns back to investors is kind of how I think about my data set. And so if we look at M&A and IPO, we see that you know, M&A has been pretty consistent over the years. And the first half of this year at 14 M&A, we're really on a pace to, to have a good uh, M&A year. Nine IPOs really, again, put us on track to have a very, very strong exit year in device. And if we look at you know, the exit values by year, which I include market cap at IPO plus private M&A upfront and milestones. You can see, you know, 2020 was a really good year, $14 billion. Uh, 2021 already at $10 billion in the first half of this year. So, you know, we're looking pretty good for value back to the investors on the device side. And if you look at, at IPOs, and here are the ones that we, we looked at for the first half of 2021, these are the nine IPOs. You can see really strong IPO performance post IPO. And it's across a different, different areas. You know, it includes some Shanghai and Hong Kong deals, um, but overall really good performance. And in fact, when you look at performance of device versus every other healthcare sector, device has had the best venture healthcare performance in the last three years over biopharma, over health tech, over DX tools. And then we've already seen a couple uh, site sciences and RX site, uh, two ophthalmology companies uh, traded in the, in the second half of this year. And then Procept you know, also has happened during, uh, I have to look and see, um, I don't quite recall where they are in the process, but you know, again, we're seeing really good opportunities for these companies to get into the public market. I will say that, um, Median pre-money valuations and dollars and dollars raised for IPOs in the first half of this year were a little bit down, but we do expect to see some some bigger deals, you know, in the, in the second half to to really kind of raise those dollars up. But in the end, what we're seeing is the fact that you have the ability to IPO and the fact that post IPO performance is really strong is one of the reasons why you see these private equity hedge fund investors coming into these Series C and D uh, deals on the private side. And so specifically on the M&A side for private M&A, you know, kind of dissecting those 14 deals, overall, the upfront and total deal number values are, are up in terms of median values. Again, really good to see. Time to exit tends to be a little bit longer than what we see in biopharma at six years uh, from series A to exit, but still very good. 
And what we've seen, uh, one is Boston Scientific. They were prolific on, an, on acquiring companies in 2018 and 2019, but then they went really quiet. So we saw them back in making an, a, making an acquisition, which is really good. But even more important, I think, is that we're finally seeing these small and mid-cap public companies deciding that they want to make plays on venture-backed technologies. And so you're seeing companies like Nuvasiv and C-Spine, Exonix, Hill-Rom, Haymanetics, all coming in and buying venture-backed device companies, which is very, very exciting. Even if it's you know, uh, cash and stock, you know, this is really good news for the device industry because I would say you know, the biggest issue that we see on the M&A side is the small group of acquirers. The smaller the group of acquirers, the more likely you are to force those companies to get later stage until before these small group of acquirers pull the trigger because they have the ability to because there's not a lot of competition. Now we're seeing more competition in the sector, which I think is really good. Um, you know, some of the biggest deals that we saw were really in the non-invasive monitoring side, where we had Preventus and Barty DX as two of the bigger ones. Again, uh, non-invasive monitoring cardiovascular, really good to see, see that deal. We also saw a step up in orthopedic uh, activity as well. And so, you know, the other thing I wanted to take, and this is to Ben's question from earlier, is looking at the pathway, because I think it's really interesting to see, you know, based on, on the type of product that you're developing and where that fits within the market, how is the exit environment in M&A for device? And I think you have sort of three pathways. You have the 510K pathway, which means basically, you know, there's already a predicate device out there. You typically don't need uh, any, if not very little clinical data to get to, um, uh, clearance to, to sell your product. Then you have de novo 510K, which is typically you have clinical trials, but it's not maybe as extensive as a PMA. PMA being totally new technology, no predicates out there, significant clinical trials, et cetera. It's a really interesting thing. You know, on 510K deals, almost every single one of those needs clearance, sort of a commercialization round and some sort of revenue ramp to get to exit. Whereas on the PMA side, Majority of these deals, 18 of the 19 for the deals from 2015 to 2017, got acquired before FDA approval. So new technologies in interesting areas that have some data, but not necessarily approval, can get picked up. Whereas on the 510K side, you have to get acquired or you have to get into, into revenue in order to, to think about acquisition. And that has sort of stayed on the from 2018 to 2021 as well. But what's interesting is the 510K deals have actually gotten better in terms of economics, where they've been able to figure out a way of investing less capital to get to exit, but the upfront and total deal value is actually bigger than what we saw from 2015 to 2017, which gives a better overall deal multiple and a quicker time to exit than we saw in the previous cycle. Whereas the PMA side is actually taking a little bit more dollars and the actual deal sizes have gone down a little bit. So multiples have been pushed a little bit on PMA. There's still good exits to be found, and, um, but it's just interesting to see. It's taken a little bit longer on the PMA side and, you're, and you end up uh, not having the type of multiples that we saw from 2015 to 2018 like, or 2015 to 2017. Again, this is just data for you to sink your teeth in and think about, and you can see where the indications are uh, for these. And obviously, you know, there's not a lot of, of numbers on the DeNovo 510K, 510K uh, deals, but I will say those tend to be the most lucrative. You know, they all have to get FDA approval before they got acquired. At least that's what the data says in, in, for all the, the M&As that we've seen to date. But the multiples have been very good. Uh, and so that sort of goes over our M&A side for device. Any questions at this point, or I can jump into the, the health tech. Uh, we have a final three slides and then we're done. Just one quick clarification question. Um, so the aggregate count of exits, um, just is sort of clarifying, was this before or after the trials? Like we're... Uh, oh, on, on this side? On this? Yeah. <clears throat> yep. So the exits are, if you look at it, it's, it's sort of color-coded. So nine, so for PMA nine, those are development stage companies uh, somewhere within clinical trials. Um, six is CE mark only, which means they have their CE mark and they're probably in some sort of clinical trial in the US. And then obviously FDA approved means you have gone through 
your FDA approval process. So hopefully that gives you a sense. Development stage could be anywhere in the development spectrum from preclinical or into clinical trials. Um, we just sort of looked at it as sort of pre-approval with no CE mark. Uh, CE mark only is typically the companies are, are looking at both US and, and European pathways, but they got their CE mark, which means they do have the ability to commercialize in Europe. And then there's another question on any other insight you might have on why acquirers have been shifting over to 510K. You know, I, I, I don't know. I think one of, a, one of the issues could be that um, with the more small to mid cap acquirers, they don't have the ability to maybe bid and do some of these really larger PMA based transactions. And maybe they're looking to uh, find complementary products that are already out in the market that's not going to impact their revenue numbers. Or, or, or their EPS numbers uh, by finding something that is close to being accretive or accretive to the bottom line. It could be that being more exciting now uh, with those smaller requires, but it's hard to know. Um, I think also uh, entrepreneurs are being a lot more smart about how they're allocating their capital to get these companies uh, 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 to sort of jumpstart the development process and get into commercialization as quickly as possible. But I also think you know, the, the other side of it is maybe these companies are getting funded a little bit later stage too. Um, I think both of those are sort of reasonable perspectives. I do think that entrepreneurs are being smarter about their, their allocation and, and how much capital they're taking and getting further with it. Um, but I also think over the last couple of years before we saw the uptake in Series A device that it, it was very hard to get funded. And those companies had to do whatever they could to continue to progress to get the uh, um, uh, Series A funding round actually completed. I think there might be, when I think about um, 510K versus PMA, I feel like these days in a values-based care environment, you, a 510K pathway has a very clear reimbursement conversation. Whereas on the PMA side, I don't think the, the reimbursement is necessarily as clear because a lot of times if you're trying to do something that's never been done before, you got to go out and get your code too, kind of thing. And the capital requirements in are really high, where if you're not really sure about all that as an investor, it's probably a lot harder to make that investment. Uh, and when you combine yep. that with entrepreneurs who know how to navigate values-based care, you know, that's my sort of my point of, point of view on that question. Just to, yeah. Uh, and then, and then maybe one other point, Ben, I think, yeah, you sort of got me thinking about this. When you think about sort of the PMA side on the M&A side, the reason why the dollar values may be down as well is because the IPO market is open. And so you are seeing PMA deals decide to raise that big round of commercialization instead of taking an M&A because they see a potential lucrative IPO down the road. Um, and so I think some of the companies that might have taken uh, an early M&A offer that were PMA based companies are instead finding these late stage investors that are willing to do large rounds to get them set, set up to be able to go into the public market. And so I think there, that's, that could be a reason why maybe the, the deals and, and the numbers are down a little bit on the PMA side. And so with that, let me just do the, uh, oh, this was the last uh, slide I had on device. I think it's kind of interesting to look at you know, dollars invested into the sector versus the type of exits that you're finding uh, in the sector. And what was interesting is, you know, it's sort of the theory that device continues to be a very steady source of exits. And you can see there's a ratio between the exit values that we see, which is the IPO uh, market cap at IPO plus uh, any private M&A uh, divided by you know, VC investment in, in the device sector. So you're getting a, a good 2x on that, which is great to see. I think when you look at it versus the other, sec other sectors out there, you know, biopharma certainly has been outperforming every other sector out there. So that's not really a surprise. DX Tools has just recently started to really perform. And not until 2020 did we really start to see some real exit activity in DX Tools. So, you know, during this period of time, device was really, you know, the superior um, sort of return on investment, if you want to think about it that way. And then health tech is kind of all over the map where you don't see the consistency. So, when you know, I typically saw, call you know the device sector slow and steady, and I really think that the numbers sort of back it up. And so, with that, let's let's sort of chat really quick about health tech, and then we'll get to any Q and A at the end. So, 
you know, one, IPOs uh, are, are certainly driving value where you have big IPOs like Doximity at 10 billion and, and Bright Healthcare as well, really dominating the IPOs. But we have seen those IPOs actually not perform as well. Whereas device, we continue to see really solid performance. The IPO performance in health tech, it's a plus 3% average. It's significantly down compared to last year. Last year, the health tech IPOs, the seven IPOs, average performance post IPO was plus 147%. Um, so we are seeing less performance there. Although, you know, the last couple of deals that were in, you know, in, in June were actually up a little bit. So that's, that's kind of good to see. But what we're seeing is a lot more, actually, as I talked about, attention on the SPAC side and attention on the M&A side. And when we look at the M&A, you know, it, a lot of these end up being undisclosed, but we're seeing more of these actually being disclosed. And the deals that we do see are really strong deals. And in fact, there were 12 deals just in the first half of this year where they had upfront values of $50 million or more. And obviously, uh, Iora Health, a billion dollar exit was, was sort of the leader there. But we also saw, while we didn't see as much IPOs on the alternative care side, we did see an increase in M&A. So we've already met what we saw in 2020 on the M&A side and 2021, the first half. And you can see some of the deals that are here. Um, uh, you know, alternative care sort of leading the, the charge with provider operations, uh, also being you know, a big area where there's notable $100 million plus or $50 million plus deals. So good to see. We're starting to see more activity. That, Exit side is sort of catching up with the investment side. Although I will say, when you think about the $28 billion plus privately valued deals that just happened in the first half of this year, it really makes you stop and think about, you know, where are the winners going to be decided? What's going to be the exit strategy for those companies? Is there going to be an M&A? Is there going to be an IPO? And once one of those first couple of companies in a space get picked up, is there room for other folks? And it makes me just sort of wonder maybe, you know, while we say the whole healthcare sector may be a little bit frothy, maybe the health tech sector is frothier than maybe the other sectors. Uh, and with that sort of the last slide before we get to some final questions, you know, where do we think things are going to go from here? You know, I think venture fundraising is going to hit $30 billion plus for healthcare, which is fantastic. Uh, a lot of capital out in the market. Investment into companies, $65 billion, which blows away what we saw in 2020 as a, as a big record year. Device, I think, should continue on an aggressive pace. I think six to eight IPOs in the second half, we've already seen three. Um, I also think M&A is going to continue to be very strong. Um, it's great to see those small to mid-cap folks making acquisitions. Health tech, I think we're going to see activity slow a little bit because a lot of these investors are readying their companies for some sort of exit discussion, be it a SPAC, be it M&A, be it IPO. And so I, th I think uh, dollars will be down in the second half of the year. I think we'll have 15 IPOs for the year with another five or, or more billion dollar either SPAC or M&A deals announced in the second half. And, you know, we're going to continue to see sort of strong, strong focus in health tech. The question is, is the M&A IPO SPAC appetite big enough to support all the really highly valued companies that we see in the market? And then with that, I know I kind of went over, but we did stop for questions along the way. Uh, we have at least six minutes plus for, for, for questions if anybody has it. And again, sort of thanks, you know, thanks to everybody for, for listening in. And I'm going to stop sharing and we'll kind of bring everybody else, bring Ben and I back up. We definitely have questions, John. I think we have okay, questions good. right now that we have time to answer. And I'm going to pick three here. Okay. Uh, and if we um, get through all three, great. Uh, but I just want to put them all out there and you can answer them in the order that you prefer. So the first question was from way back at the beginning about any, um, any uh, discernible trends you see between you know, large raises and whether whether or not a device company got a breakthrough designation. So that's the first question. Second question has to do mm -hmm. with how are SPACs doing relative to IPOs and what's that what's that all yeah. about? And then the third is sort of about um, uh, the international aspect of M and A activity. I mean, what are we thinking about? Uh, what, what are the trends happening there? I know that there's yeah. a lot of conversation there about dollar, you know, weak dollar, and you know, are you better off? you know, going all US and then getting acquired over there. And there's, you know, there's a lot of talk about that. And this question, I'm sure, you know, delves into that as well. So just open it up to you there to, to kind of pick and choose which ones you want to answer. Okay, great. And, and I think on the SPAC side, we kind of talked about what, what we saw is IPOs performing a lot better than SPACs after DSPAC. But the, the SPACs themselves have better, higher valuations than what we've seen on the IPO side. 
So it's going to be very interesting. It's really almost like let's look at those deals a year after they either IPO'd or de spac and let's look at the market cap and let's get a sense for similar companies who's actually done better. Um, I'm really not sure what that's going to look like, but I will say most of the SPACs or when you de spac you're also doing a pipe. And so those companies have, you know, one, two plus years of cash. So it does give them room to grow into the valuation that they went out at and actually increase that valuation without having to come back to the market to raise money. So I do think SPAC is a definitely a viable alternative. It's just interesting that you're seeing the performance is not really matching up with what we see on the IPO side. Um, and then what was the the, the first question? Um, I'm I'm the breakthrough, forgetting. yeah, about breakthrough oh. designation. If there's any correlation to that, and getting a ton of funding, you know, are people are investors backing up the truck for the breakthrough designation. I I will say that the anecdotally, the companies with breakthrough designation have had some of the bigger financings out there. I do think it's 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 an important uh, leverage point. You know, the question is, you know, are, um, you know, is that under attack, and what's what's going to happen with breakthrough designations yep. um, down in in the future? But I do think that that is a value add. Uh, certainly to investors, because it, it allows things to get streamlined in a way that um, non-breakthrough designations don't, don't have. And then, you know, finally, on the international side, really hard to tell. I do think that, you know, on the, on the device side, for sure, you know, the vast majority of investment that we're seeing is either, you know, in the U.S., I think we continue to see a lot of uh, innovative companies coming out of Israel, um, you know, on the, on the EU side or the European side, just not, not as much. And actually, I think we've also seen less engagement from Asia venture investors, especially in China on the device side. I think that was a big top of the conversation a couple of years ago, where there were a lot of, of those investors that were circling and looking to either do joint development or, or be a big investor in those, in those companies. I feel like that's retracted a little bit. I don't think you're seeing as much activity in that side. Um, ben, anything else you want to add on that side? I just have a personal point of view on, um, we've been living in a strong dollar environment for a really long time. And um, at some point that's going to flip. And um, you could get to the point where you could develop a company in you know, Eurozone and take it, get your CE mark, get yourself prepped for US uh, commercialization, and maybe even you know, start that process and exit to a strategic at a lower valuation than you would have had you had been a US domicile company, but on the translation back to dollars actually make up the difference and actually be financially better off. And so then what I've been trying to figure out is, you know, are there any investors that are trying to follow that theme? And if so, are they doing their the investing? That should manifest in the numbers here over time. You know, yeah, I, I just, it's a rhetorical for me. It's a big yeah, definitely investment. interesting. And I think you know the other the other side to that is because of being forced into the virtual interaction. I think investors are now a lot more confident and comfortable having discussions with companies that are not in their backyard. Um, and and I think we'll continue to see maybe start to see more in funding outside of the perennial hotspots of innovation that we've seen over the past few years, where really interesting companies that are outside of that area because, you know, either cost of living or, or the ability to, 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 you know, space or whatever it is, but, but still finding those companies actually getting funded by top investors because there is that comfort level of, oh, it's okay if you're not in my backyard because we are now in an area where we've seen how this can work and we've gotten successes in investing into companies that we basically interact with mostly remote and it's been okay. So in other words, you can be a med tech entrepreneur and a cattle rancher at the same time. Exactly. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Christine, anything else uh, from you as we sort of get to the end of the hour? I think we will, uh, it's a good time to uh, end. I think it's... Uh... Thank you for everybody attending and all your questions. And again, special thanks to you, John and Ben, for um, having this, uh, taking the time to share with us your insight. Absolutely. It's our pleasure. Always, always happy to talk. And if anyone has sort of specific questions, you're always welcome to, to, to ping myself and Ben. And we're always happy. You know, that's kind of part of what we do. It's about um, engaging and, and finding ways to be helpful to the to the to the companies that are out there. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out. We're always happy to talk.
Thanks. Right. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Christine. Have a Appreciate good it. Good afternoon, everybody. Okay. Bye. Bye.